Thank you. Thanks for the <coughs> to the organizer for inviting me. So here are my disclosure. I'm the co-founder of a immuno oncology diagnostic company, and I talk to people in the industry. So what we have been doing for many, many years is not to focus on a particular molecule, not to focus on a particular cell, but really try to decipher and to deeply analyze the human tumor microenvironment with multi-omics approach, but not only genomics, but also immunomics approaches. And <clears throat> really, when we started, we really wanted to see, does it really matter, this pre-existing immunity that we can detect within tumors? And I'd like to remind you that this is not a new topic. I think the first publication showing that <coughs> lymphocytic infiltration was associated with longevity is from 1921. So almost a century after, what is the situation when a cancer patient is coming at the hospital? Well, there is a great deal and a lot of ways to characterize the disease, meaning the tumor cells. Uh, the tumor classification are based on the tumor extension, tumor invasion, TNM staging, based on that anatomy. Uh, pathology, tumor morphology, tumor grade, etc., based on the tumor cell of origin, in some instance, uh, based on molecular pathways, the alteration, the genomic alteration of the tumor cells, microsatellite instability, <coughs> chromosomal instability. We heard yesterday about tumor gene expression, signature CMS, and of course the mutation status of the tumor cell is done. But when a patient is coming at the hospital, we don't know anything about the immune system of the, of the patient. We don't know anything about the host immune response that the, all the patients have in different ways. So there are currently no way, non-evaluation of immune parameters. And back in 2006, we published in Science this paper that was the foundation for this concept of immune contexture that we proposed. Uh, what we found was that four important parameters in terms of the immunity of the patients are very profoundly associated with the survival of the patients. Those consist in the, the quality of the immune response that can be measured by immune signatures and specific types of adaptive immunity. And then there are three other types of parameters, the type of immune cells, what cells, immune cells are important for uh, patients to survive. Their density is extremely important and where they are located, their location. And in fact, what we showed was that the patients with a high density of these cytotoxic T cells in both tumor regions, the center of the tumor and the invasive margin of the tumor, those patients were protected from tumor recurrence. You can see here a very uh, long follow-up, more than 15 years follow-up on those patients. And these patients have, in fact, what we are now calling immunoscore, have a high immunoscore, high density of adaptive immune cells in the center and invasive margin. As you can see, the patients, in more than 80% of the cases, don't have tumor recurrence if they have a high immunoscore. In contrast, the patients with a low immunoscore do relapse very rapidly. And as you can see from the curve, this is happening regardless of the TNM staging system. Patients with an early stage, like stage two or stage one, as I showed yesterday, those patients will have a very rapid tumor recurrence if the patients don't have a good adaptive immunity. In contrast, the patients with immunoscore four, which have the highest immunoscore, those patients are protected and will live without tumor recurrence. Again, regardless of the stage of the patients. So this coordinated adaptive immune response, more than the classical tumor invasion parameters, was really associated with the survival of the patients. And the novel paradigm really came when we did all the statistical analysis with Cox multivariate to test the strength and the dependency, putting into the Cox model the strongest parameter, T stage, and stage, grade of differentiation with this immune evaluation, immunoscore. And not only immunoscore is highly significant on a Cox multivariate analysis, but all the other parameters become non-significant. They are statistically dependent upon the pre-existing immunity of the patient. Tumor progression is statistically dependent upon the pre-existing immunity of the patients. And so um, we put this idea that these immune contexture parameters are really key players uh, to prevent tumor recurrence 
for the survival of the patients, and as we know now also, for the likelihood of response to immunotherapy. We went deeper into this analysis to try to understand why is it that the T stage, the N stage, are no longer significant on a Cox multivariate analysis, and why is it that they are dependent on the immunoscore? And this is the result of a Cox multivariate uh, analysis uh, that you can see here, where only the, the bowel perforation remains significant together with immunoscore. And this is our, our paper where we describe the relationship between these uh, uh, tumor-related parameters with the immune parameters uh, with this quite provocative editorial TNM, T is for T cell and M is for memory. That was back in 2011. And when comparing the gold standard AGCC TNM classification with the immunoscore classification on the multivariate analysis, as you can see for DFS, OS, or DSS, the immunoscore classifications remain significant, and the TNM staging system is dependent upon the pre-existing immunity of the patients. And so we, as I showed yesterday, uh, more recent results, but back in 2009, we already had shown the, in the GCO paper that the patients with early stage, stage one, two, which in 20% of the case are relapsing, this is 18 years of follow-up, when doing immunoscore in that case, the densities of the cytotoxic T cells and the memory T cells in both tumor regions, center and invasive margin of the tumor, the patients with a high immunoscore four, here as you can see, more than 95% of them will not have tumor recurrence. But you can see that these patients with low immunoscore one, two, or even worse, immunoscore zero, are very high risk patients, even though they are early stage patients. And the Cox multivariate analysis shows that immunoscore, the immune pattern is highly significant. And we analyze these spatiotemporal dynamics because the tumor cells are changing, are proliferating and changing. The immune microenvironment is also changing. And so we analyze this evolution of the immune landscape, as you can see here in this paper in Immunity 2013, showing how the immune microenvironment is changing and when this immune microenvironment is changing, uh, the progression from T1 to T2, what is changing between T2 and T3, and what is changing between T3 and T4. And to link the tumor genomics with the immunity of the patients, we analyze deeply uh, the patients, in particular in terms of their microsatellite instability, because the DNA mismatch repair deficiency for an immunologist is a very interesting aspect of uh, genomic alteration because it creates frame shift mutations. And these frame shift mutations, of course, are very different in terms of peptide compared to the normal peptides, which means that they can be very much immunogenic, which we deeply analyze with uh, microsatellite instability testing with the type of frame shift mutations that were generated in the patients and showing with genetic evidence that immunoediting do exist in human, meaning the specific deletion of immunogenic mutations in comparison to the non-immunogenic mutations, and showed with uh, chromium assay that the T cells from the patients were able to kill the tumor cells when those tumor cells were bearing specific frame shift mutations and we could detect anti-tumor specific uh, T cells on those patients. The point about the survival in these MSI patients is that what is, uh, and you have here on the left, overall survival, and on the right, disease-specific survival. You have four curves, MSI, MSS, and immunoscore high, three and four, versus immunoscore low, uh, zero and two. And what you can see from the curves is that the patients with a high immunoscore, so the blue and pink curves, are the ones that are protected and live longer, whether they are MSS or MSI. Vice versa, the patients with a low immunoscore don't do well, they will relapse very rapidly. Again, regardless of whether they are MSS or MSI, the only difference is that much more frequently, patients with MSI can have a high immunoscore because they have, in particular, frame shift mutations, not only, but more frequently, those patients MSI are of high immunoscore. But what matters for the survival of the patients is not the MSI per se, is the consequence of MSI and that we can detect here with the uh, immunoscore. So in the current situation, the staging of the patient is based on the TNM, morphology of the tumor cells, classification of tumor cells of origin, molecular pathways, mutations, 
and there's not a single assay to tell us something about the immunity of the patient. So the idea behind immunoscore now is to simplify it to bring immunoscore to the clinic by doing uh, easy histopathological stains, quantifying the density, taking into account the location. And we propose to introduce into the cancer classification I, like a TNM I classification, TNM immune classification. And that's why we initiated this worldwide consortium uh, with many countries involved, uh, testing and validating immunoscore. The publication was uh, 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 the International Validation of the Consensus Immunoscore was published last year in The Lancet, as I showed this list yesterday, showing that in fact, immunoscore in terms of relative contribution to the risk represent half of the risk in comparison to the other, all the other parameters. So without immunoscore, N stage is the most important, followed by T stage, grade of differentiation, venous emboli, lymphatic invasion, perineural invasion, MSI is here. But when you add immunoscore, the relative contribution to the risk, as you can see, changed dramatically. And more importantly, all the other parameters, N stage, T stage, grade of differentiation, VLEP, MSI, are all dependent upon immunoscore. So in Cox multivariate analysis, you have now immunoscore with all p-values below 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0,0001, whether you do immunoscore in two groups, high-low, three groups, high-intermediate-low, or five categories, immunoscore, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So now I'd like to move to stage three and to the predictive value of immunoscore in randomized phase three clinical trials. Uh, before to do that, I'd like to show you some data, some of them being uh, um, published, uh, about the immunoscore, so the consensus immunoscore, performed in uh, four inde independent data sets. A French cohort, the worldwide uh, uh, SITC study, the American US N0147 phase three clinical trial, and the IDEA phase three clinical trial. With the predefined cutoff of immunoscore that was predefined with a statistical uh, work plan done uh, by external statistician from the Mayo Clinic, and we use this predefined cutoff to test immunoscore on those patients blindly to clinical outcome. More than 2,500 patients were tested. Immunoscore, in, and, this is, uh, and this is now an uh, 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 idea where you can see um, the immunoscore in two groups, high versus low, or immunoscore in three groups, because of course, now if we stratify <coughs> immunoscore, it's a <coughs> continuous variable. And so you can, you can see that high immunoscore predicts very good survival, whereas low immunoscore predicts very bad survival. <coughs> this demonstrates the prognostic value of immunoscore again on a phase three randomized trial. If we look at the other uh, cohorts, now stratified into five categories of immunoscore, immunoscore zero, the worst, immunoscore one, two, three, and four. You have the five categories of immunoscore here, you can see that patients with immunoscore four, not a single relapse in the French court, not a single relapse on the CITC study, not a single relapse on the uh, N0147, and not a single relapse on the IDEA clinical trial, phase, uh, phase three clinical trial. All these patients are stage three. Um, and you can see the direct relationship between immunoscore, zero, one, two, three, four, and the survival of the patients and the relapse of the patients on those four independent data sets. Now, mo moving to the predictive value of immunoscore, IDEA was comparing three months to six months chemotherapy. On the left side, now you have a high immunoscore patients. These are all false fox treated patients from the French study. 1,062 patients were studied uh, immunoscore was performed on all of those patients, and as you can see, very significantly, P0.0003, six months chemotherapy is beneficial compared to three months chemotherapy in patients with a high immunoscore, meaning that you need to have a pre-existing immunity to be able to respond to longer type chemotherapy. In contrast, the patients with a low immunoscore absolutely do not benefit P0.27, to six months chemotherapy. So immunoscore significantly predicts in that study the response to six month fox in all the patients with stage three. 
So what about the, the low risk and the high risk? If we go to the subgroup of the low risk, T1, T3, N1 patients, so of course they are high risk, better survival. You see that very clearly and significantly P0.01, high pa patients with a high immunoscore do respond better to six months chemotherapy. So even though you have a patient that is a low risk and has a high immunoscore, you, based on these results, better treat that patient six months because it's significantly better. In contrast, again, the low immunoscore patients do not benefit from the six month 0.56. Now moving to the high risk group, so high risk T4 or N2, now those patients have worse survival, but again, even though they are high risk, the ones with a high immunoscore do significantly benefit p-value 0.006 from six months chemotherapy, in contrast to the low immunoscore who do not significantly benefit. So all the subgroups of stage three patients do benefit to six months chemofolfox when they have a high immunoscore, meaning a higher pre-existing immunity. And the low immunoscore patients do not benefit from six months chemotherapy. Now, if we go back to the CITSI study, which included patients retrospectively, so this is not a randomized trial, but among the stage three patients, there were patients that were not treated with chemotherapy for whatever reason in the, depend in the different countries. Some of them were not treated, but some patients refused the treatment. And so we had like a control arm, even though it was not randomized, some untreated phase, stage three patients. If you look at the patients who do not receive chemotherapy in stage three, they are doing badly. And those who receive chemotherapy are doing better when they have a high immunoscore. But the patients with a low immunoscore, in that case immunoscore zero, they are a worse outcome, but the chemotherapy don't do nothing. No significance, p-value 0.83. So you need this pre-existing immunity for chemotherapy to be efficient. So based on all those results, immunoscore is significant for stage three and it's prognostic. We published that in science already in 206, in GCO in 211, and for those four independent data sets, uh, SCC study, the French court, N0147 phase three clinical trial and IDEA clinical trial. Based on the IDEA clinical trial, we can see that high immunoscore is significantly predictive of the response to chemotherapy. Uh, this is the same for the low risk and the high risk group. And immunoscore significantly predict these six months when the patients have a high immunoscore, but the low immunoscore patients do not significantly click entry respond to chemotherapy or to six months chemotherapy. So of course, we would like to validate these results on other idea like clinical trials from other countries. Now moving to the latest, phase of the disease, stage four, what is happening? Is there an immune escape? And so what we did was to analyze now the metastasis of the patients, not the primary tumors. We analyze more than 600 resected tumors, either from the liver or lung, and perform the consensus immunoscore in the same way that it is done on the primary tumors, but now on the metastasis. We published this paper in Cancer Cell where we analyzed the multiverse of metastasis in terms of immune microenvironment. I will not enter into the detail of that paper. And we also asked the question, is other results and is it compatible with the current theories of cancer evolution? And I'd like to remind you the four models or the four current theories of cancer evolution. There's the linear model saying that you need multiple consecutive driver mutations before dissemination can occur. The neutral model say, says that there's no selection whatsoever of tumor clones specifically uh, based on their mutations and they are all progressing. The big bang model in contrast saying that uh, you need multiple drivers before dissemination can occur. And probably the most accepted is the branch model saying that there could be different driver mutation on different tumor clones and they would evolve, they would be selected based on those drivers and uh, evolve independently. All those models have a common thing is that none of them is implying that there could be a possible immune pressure and a possible Darwinian selection of tumor clones based on immunity. And so we analyzed that, we published that in cell evolution of metastasis in space and time 
and their immune selection. And to be able to answer that question in human, what we did was to take patients with very long history, with primary tumor available, with multiple synchronous metastasis or resected, and with multiple metachronous and recurrence, all the metastases being re resected. So patients of the re recurrence, metastasis was resected. Again, one year later, the patient had another recurrence, and we selected all those patients to uh, be able to do e immunomics, genomics, and we did all the genomics, RNA sequencing, DNA exome sequencing, look at all the possible drivers, all the possible alterations, and look at the immuno editing of the mutations. And we could now trace from the primary tumor what was the evolution of the different tumor clones and which parent metastasis gave the child metastasis. Uh, and you can see these very complex features and, and evolution of clones. Beyond the phylogenetic tree that we could draw, we also did the evolvogram of the tumor clone. So now looking at the uh, main tumor clone, for example, on that patient, his main clone, in fact, from the primary tumor is not disseminating. You can see it disappears and never reappear again. The second main clone is the one that is disseminating that you can see, you can follow. But you can see new clone emerging in metastasis, like this orange one, and a subclone, the green one, from that orange clone. The green one is disappearing and never reappearing again, even though it was a major clone on that metastasis. Uh, and we analyze the immunoediting of the tumor of the metastasis and of the tumor clone. And what we found was that, in fact, the non-recurrent clone are immunoedited whereas the progressing clone are immune privileged and are not immunoedited. So we did a very deep analysis of the tumor microenvironment by immunostochemistry, digital pathology and quantification, and by multispectral multi analysis to try to understand the relationship between the genomics and the immune microenvironment on all those metastases. And we end up showing that there are three different types of metastases based on their pre-existing immunity, their natural immunity inside the metastasis and immunoscore, and based on the immunoediting. When we did the Cox multivariate analysis to predict the dissemination and the likelihood of recurrence among all the parameters, all the genomics parameters, four parameters remained significant. The immunoscore within the metastasis of interest, the distance between the T cells and the ongoing proliferating tumor cells, so the KI67 positive tumor cells, and their distance to, to T cells. The immunoediting, so the deletion of immunogenic mutations, are all good. In contrast, the metastasis size is significantly remaining uh, in the multivariate model and is bad, meaning the bigger the metastasis, the more likely there will be a disseminating clone. Uh, and we validated that in 132 patients with immunoediting, uh, immunoscore, and the predictive models with the four parameters. So now we have three different types of metastasis based on immunoscore and immunoediting with different um, escape mechanisms that have been associated with those. Uh, we've shown that the immunoedited clones, those ones, are not disseminating, whereas the immune privileged clones are disseminating. And we propose now a novel theory, which is now based also on an immune impact that is a parallel immune selection model, where in fact immunity plays a role into the shaping of the tumor clone and which clones, tumor clones, are likely to disseminate based on the dynamic interaction of tumor cells with immune cells and the Darwinian selection of the escape variant. Lastly, for the staging of the stage for patients. Currently, there is a pathological evaluation. We can bring all of those into a pathological score. The main criteria for metastasis are steatohepatitis, AGP, NRH, tumor regression grade, TRG, the R status, and the number of lesions. If we bring all of those into a pathological score, plus the RAS mutation status that is commonly done, and now we test also immunoscore and we look at the recurrence rate and at the survival rate of the patients and do again a multivariate analysis to test the uh, relative contribution to the risk in stage uh, four using the, this pathology, classical pathological score. Now you can see that for TTR, for the recurrence, this pathological score is important and immunoscore is important and both are significant 
for the overall survival of the patients, uh, the pathological score is no longer significant. None of those parameters remain significant. The immunoscore represents more than half of the risk is significant, and the RAS status is actually significant for the survival in that study. So finally, I'd like to say that in all clinical trials, or in most of the clinical trials, uh, the patients, we are mixing those patients. We are mixing patients with who could be immunoscore four and patients with immunoscore zero, assuming that they will respond similarly to whatever drug, and in particular to immunotherapy. And I believe this is not the case. I believe that these patients, for example, are much more likely to respond to uh, checkpoints, in particular the ones that are TH1, that do express uh, because uh, TH1, PDL1. And uh, we propose in that review uh, ways to do combination therapies based on the pre existing immunity of the patients. Um, you can uh, read that. And uh, it is possible now to do immune classification of patients instead of having apple and oranges in terms of the immune microenvironment in the same trial. And with that, I'd like to thank all the people in the lab, in particular to thank all the clinicians that have been involved and our sponsors, and to thank SITSI, uh, the Society for Immunotherapy of Cancer in the US, and all the centers who validated Immunoscore in the SITSI study. And I thank you for your attention.